Do you ever feel stuck like you're living your life on autopilot? Are you ready to shift into high gear and reach the success you so richly deserve? Welcome to the Play Big Movement podcast. I am your host, Sharon Lecter, entrepreneur, business strategist, and best-selling author. Playing big is not about settling for good enough or being comfortable. It is about reaching your highest potential and achieving your greatest success. Join me in my Play Big Movement as I interview top experts in business, money, and entrepreneurship, all ready to serve you and to help you play big, be number one in your field, live your legacy, and create maximum impact. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this segment of the Play Big Movement podcast with Sharon Lecter. Today, I get to interview a new friend and introduce to you Julianne O'Connor. And what a dynamo. I love it because she is on a mission to put the word relate back into relationships worldwide. She's the founder of SIO Dream Fund. And Julianne, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so honored, truly. Well, I love you. You've dedicated that that uh, kind of gray space between you know, somebody's profession, their personal life, and you've written books. You've um, done t- TEDx and NSA speaker. You're a mom, foster mom, mm-hmm. and you know, you're a work-life balance strategist. I always say rather than saying work-life balance, I'll say one big life, Mm -hmm. but I'd love for you to share, let's start with little Julian and what you wanted to do out of your life and then how you found this piece of your um, message today. Oh, wow. Um, So little Julian. So that, that's an interesting and wonderful, fun question. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up on this crazy property um, outside of Reno, Nevada, that was um, highly contaminated. Actually, the the ground was contaminated, our water was contaminated, the air above the soil was contaminated. And so at the time, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really, you don't really realize what the impact of that could be. But then my father died. And, um, and we began to go through this testing and start to learn and it kind of uncover that this was really serious stuff. And so when I was young, you know, I was like, I want to be an actor, a model, whatever, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, you know, it was like the, the dream stuff and, you know, dance, sing, you know, all those things that little girls think of. But the reality was I kind of got hit with this idea that life could be short. And so I think really, really, really young, um, well, young relative to what, I don't know, but, but at a young age, I started to analyze what's the, you know, what's the meaning to life and what really matters. And I thought if you're stripped of everything, you know, all of your financial status, your everything, what really, what remains and it's, it's your relationships. And so that became a really, you know, high level of importance for me. Um, and, you know, and going back to what you said about work-life balance, it's really funny because as life unfolds, you can't balance them. <laughs> and so it's really about perspective around that topic, mm-hmm. I think more than anything. So. I hope that well, answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely does. And so you are a mom, a foster mom. Share a little bit more about where you are today and why you've chosen to focus on this career. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting because life is so strange and unusual and imperfect. And I think in the career world, depending on who you are and what kind of an entrepreneur you are, what you do with your life, you know, I never set out to be an author, but I ended up becoming an author. And Um, you know, there's so many things and there's so many different revenue streams that come into your world. And then it's, you know, trying to figure out how do you identify with what you actually do, right? (laughs) And who, who that really makes you at the end of the day. And, um, you know, where I'm at today, I will just tell you after having a very diverse career up, up until now, and I don't feel like that's anywhere close to ending, but, um, is, you know, I really, really value my family. I really understand the importance of service and, 
uh, my husband and I both said we would adopt one day and, and have a daughter of our own or a child of our own. We have a, our own biological daughter. We then adopted actually during COVID, if you can believe it, virtually without even realizing the adoption was complete. <laughs> so I like like a month before we knew we had already adopted. So that's how strange the world is. Um, and then we are also the foster parents of a little girl who was born during the pandemic as well now. And once you start doing that, you just keep doing it. It's the hardest and the most rewarding thing, I think, for, for us. Well, I love it. And because right now, I think um, I've shared in other shows that um, when you talk about New Year's resolutions over the last 10 years, they've pretty much all been the same, you know, same t basic 10 categories. But this year, for the first time, they added the category family. And uh -huh. so I think it's a lot because of the 2020 pandemic and the fact that people were re-engaging with their families because they were together more. We didn't have the hustle bustle of leaving the house. Everybody was there together. And I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. So I think it definitely, your message is very important right now. And the, the value of, of um, you know, people come into your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime when your family's there for a lifetime. So it's important to make sure we invest in them and support and, and really support each other. So. 100% agreed. Uh, well, well put. So tell me a little bit about your practice right now. How do, how do you help people and families? Okay. So, um, so there's many different things. Um, I'm a business person, so I, I run a company company. Um, I run a training center. Um, that's a physical has a physical location. So that was an interesting, you know, year last year, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, I also am continuing to write and I do coach. Um, I really actually coach high achieving CEOs and dentists. And um, again, just helping them to leverage their influence and um, and really keep in perspective what matters to them. And so you see, you hear, it's not just CEOs and dentists, I'm in a lot of masterminds, but I know you've heard this your whole career, um, but you hear where people, especially if they're seasoned in their career, th that they there's this recurring theme of people kind of having worked so hard that they saw their life kind of pass by and then now their kids are grown and they're trying to get attention and, and spend more time with their kids, but now their kids are doing the same thing. And it's sort of this cyclical, you know, recurring uh, theme. And I know there's music that's been written about it, you know? Um, so I think it's really trying to be an example, number one, for my own children to always block time, you know, like <laughs> spend time with them. Don't let my career cut flow over and then vice versa. When I do my career, I'm dedicated to that. So I do I have my hands in a lot of different places um, at the moment as far as my career goes. It's funny because I always think it's it, it almost makes me nervous that you ask that question because I'm like, which one do I say? You know? <laughs> Like, well, you all, people learn different ways and they take action different ways. And so you're finding multiple ways to reach people where they are and how they want to be communicated with. So that's a, it is a benefit. Not, you know, just say I, I have a multi um, dimensional way to access information that can help people put relate back into relationships. So, so um, somebody that's watching right now and listening that is exactly there. They're kind of feeling the burnout. They're kind of feeling um, detached from their family. What, what would the, be the first two or three things that you would share with them as your advice to how them to get centered again? Yeah, you know, um, well, I could go a lot of different directions with that. But I think for me personally, it's really just, man, it's just remembering what matters. It's really like getting clear on what I'm neglecting or what I need to spend time on um, and, and how to make my priorities my priorities. So I'll go through kind of a systematic way of doing that. For example, I'll, I'll list everything of where I'm at right now, especially if I'm feeling stressed or overwhelmed or burned out. <laughs> Any of those things, I, I will make it an intention to sit down and write down everything where I'm at right now and just acknowledge it and accept it. And then I'll go through and I'll, I'll write down everything that I desire. And inevitably that's gonna come back to the family, right? In, in most cases, not, not for everybody. And then I will you know, go back to my why, why is this so important? And then you start to see you eliminate things because <laughs> suddenly not everything is as important as you were making it. And then I kind of try to bridge the gap and I just try to figure out, okay, how do I get from where I'm at to where I wanna be? And with the family, it's, it's just so easy to, to make them first because it's constantly in my mind as my highest priority. But I do still have to, to with time, 
you know, we're so limited. I still have to block it. I have to force myself. And sometimes I calendar the time that I'm going to spend with my family is as ridiculous as that sounds so that I keep no, it in my mind. Not at all. I think it's, you know, I have a lot of people that I work with, um, particularly women have this, you know, this guilt related to investing time in their business. And, and they, this whole work-life balance concept is, um, you know, they, they worry all the time about it. And I go, my definition of to worry is to pray for what you don't want. And so <laughs> we see, you know, we need to stop it. And we need to realize that if you didn't spend enough time with your kids yesterday, simply make a different choice today, but don't spend yeah. precious time today worrying about what did or did not happen yesterday. Agreed. And so too many women focus on the guilt and the worry and they use up precious time today. And I think it's really also important as a business owner to be open in your communications, because as an entrepreneur, you have an incredible opportunity to include your children, your spouse, people in your family, and what you're doing. So they see the value that you're creating and have them the opportunity, give them the opportunity to be proud of you and seeing that bigger picture. And then there's a higher level of understanding of the dedication because you know, starting a new business takes 24 seven sometimes. It takes a lot of initiative. And, and if everybody understands what you're doing, they can be proud of you and not feel angry. And it's a, it's a balance, but that communication is so important. Yeah, you know, you always, um, you have this way in all your podcasts and, and the way you talk to people of just making us all feel okay with being human. <laughs> and I love that. I mean, I do, you really do. And even as you're saying that, you know, I agree with you. You can't really balance. And we do guilt ourselves constantly. And yet at the end of the day, every day, if you just choose those priorities and, and you know, slot them in, figure out a way to make it work and, um, and keep getting a little bit better every day, you know, and you just made me think, you know, as a foster mom, what I see is I see these women who are struggling, you know, in, in very fundamental ways. And, you know, sometimes you're, you're really there to help them and try to, to help them become better mothers and, and it's um, so interesting because I just had this conversation with a mother and we were talking about the very same thing and it, and it really boiled down. I realized I was listening because I always say you teach what you need to learn, right? For me, that's the case. <laughs> and I was listening to myself tell her, look, you know, you're perfectly okay where you're at right now. You know, I'm like he hearing myself give this really basic advice going, oh, Julianne, record yourself, listen to yourself because <laughs> you know, you never end your career. We're always still striving. And what is that? <laughs> yes, it's a world where we have to practice what we preach, right? Yeah. And it's and it is so important. I mean, that's the name of my company, Pay Your Family First, because you know, why are we doing what we're doing if we if it's not to live a fuller and happier life and provide for our families? But sometimes we do get um, and have to be focused on on achieving a goal. And it's when you don't communicate to the family that the most problems occur because there's a misunderstanding, there's a jealousy. And if everybody understands what the ultimate goal is and you include them in it, then it's a kind of a team effort. And so being an entrepreneur is a wonderful way to teach your children about business and making a difference and adding value. And the fact that what you build today will can be created into an economic engine that gives you more free time in the future. So again, it's all about communication and commitment. My 11 year old will be reading your book, Exit Rich. I just want you to know. Um, <laughs> you, know you just made me think when I was growing up, my dad and my dad died, I was nine or 10 years old. Um, and he had me reading Think and Grow Rich and How to Influence and Influence People and all these great books at the time, you know, and I think about how much of an impact that had on my life. And um, so bet me that my daughter will be reading your book as, as will I. And then, you know, she's already um, incredible with money because I taught her what I hadn't learned. And so she's got this, you know, stock, stock portfolios and she's got like all this stuff. She's 11, you know, but she's meticulous with money and she understands how to break it up and what to, you know, do with every, she, she never lets a, you know, a dime slip through. And, and I, she inspires me actually. <laughs> That's so, the best so that way. That's the best. That's the best. And um, we were talking offline about the, you know, the fact that family is so important and it's become a more, you know, it's a front and center. So if there's a, there's a benefit from this pandemic, it's a getting reacquainted with family. Now, this other side of it is there's been an increase in domestic abuse and increase in child abuse, which is tragic. And we have to make sure we take care of these, um, these innocent victims. But it is time to focus back in on life, 
right? You know, are we living to work or working to live? And um, creating that, that family center is so important. And if everybody's focused on, on a similar goal and supporting you or um, you know, your business partners and creating something that adds value, at the end of the day, everybody wins, right? Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Well, um, you're the expert in terms of, you know, thinking backwards from the end, you know, first, <laughs> like starting with the end in mind. And it's funny because I feel like I literally let a lot of my life slip with not thinking that way, just kind of being in the moment with everything that I need to do. And now I'm, I'm so excited to get my hands on some of the stuff that you're sharing because um, even though, you know, it's like, it's never too late, right? But I felt a little bit like a fraud teaching my daughter even money management in the beginning because I wasn't implementing the very thing she was doing. I was like, I got to get it together because she's going to hold me responsible if she ever finds out. And so I did because of her. So everything. That's why I created the game Thrive Time for Teens over my shoulder here, because it gives an opportunity for parents to work with kids about money where the parents learn alongside them and it doesn't become too personal. Because a lot of parents don't want to talk about it because they know them, they themselves need the information. And so we, we sort of created this game, Thrive Time for Teens, and it's got a lot of humor in it, but it allows parents and teens to kind of laugh over it and learn together. So that's, that's you know, bringing it back to the kitchen table or the dining room table to sit around and, and learn these principles together. It's so very important. Yeah, I think it's true. Even it's interesting, even with you think about that, um, not just with money, but even with people who give career advice specifically, I always think oftentimes the people who give career advice, you know, they're secretly not doing what they're <laughs> advising. And, you know, I think there's a, a great story. I can't remember which um, guru it is. And she was going around and teaching, you know, money advice with her roller bag and, you know, and um, she was like negative in her bank account. Initially, she was teaching money advice and she had the revelation, just like I think a lot of people have to have that it's okay. It's like, you got to accept it. Now you take a look at where you're at, right? And then you can start to move forward and you can be, hopefully you can be transparent with your family. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I have that in my family. <laughs> yeah, you're so, oh, so right. I've talked about this often. There's so much noise and so much, um, you know, particularly with everybody going online, you really have to do your due diligence to make sure you're learning from somebody who walks the talk. I, I, there's somebody last year that was out there making a lot of money giving marriage advice and they were in their third divorce you know and it's like you know um yeah. it's each of us we need to be accountable to ourselves for the choices we make and make sure that we're doing our due diligence that we're learning from somebody who walks the talk and somebody that's sharing from a position of experience and knowledge not just whim right that so was it's so important that was entirely one of my pet peeves and reasons for writing my first book, which is spelling it out for your man, which was based on 20 years of really asking people, what's the secret to a happy marriage? And hearing this recurring themes, you know, where one out of 10 was having fun and the other nine out of 10 were complaining. And, and I was hearing simultaneous to that, these, these career, these relationship advice, you know, people giving advice that was I was like, wait a second, that's not true. That's not what, you know, these hundreds of people have told me. I was like, I got to put this in a book. You know, <laughs> like there was a point where I was just like, this isn't, that's not accurate. That's not going to work. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's how I ended up with a book, not because I wanted to be an author. <laughs> so. Well, we had a, a, a group Zoom last night. It was, you know, a celebration of my birthday. And my husband was on with me and we've just celebrated 40 years of marriage. And somebody asked us something during the Zoom and he said, yeah, I think we're, we're I think it's going to last. So <laughs> I love it. So yeah. first of all, happy birthday again. And I know we <laughs> talked about this a little bit for a second, but um, you are a great, you are a legend and it's the celebration of your existence on this planet. And, you know, so many people love you and it's so understandably, you know, it's so understandable why, uh, but 40 years. So I have to flip this and ask you, what's the secret to a happy marriage? Well, my typical response is separate bathrooms. Um, <laughs> so that usually gets the best response, but it's actually true, I think. Um, and, and certainly when we're traveling, we realize how important that is since we have to share bathrooms and hotel rooms. But no, it's really uh, um, it, respecting each other as much as you love each other, because yeah. when you are mad, the respect is still there. And it is what gets you through the tough times. And certainly we've been through some 
pretty difficult times losing a child. Many marriages don't, you know, don't survive that. But allowing each other to grieve in our own way, his was a completely different way to grieve than mine. And respecting each other enough to value and support each other through it is really important. So I think, you know, the, the, true, the true definition of a long-term um, match with the spouse is to respect each other as much as you love each other. So, yeah, I love that. That, that um, is completely consistent with my findings, which is just that you can stand by each other's side, that you don't have to ride the roller coaster of how somebody else deals with things and how they grow or don't grow with you simultaneously, but you kind of really just support them through all of that. Um, so you said separate bathrooms and I think, um, you know, it's funny. I love that. But my husband and I, I think that the only time we ever had marital problems was actually when we combined our bank accounts. And so I always go back to the money, but it's personal for everybody, right? But for me, it was definitely financial. And I, and so I recognized it because I knew this was a thing. You know, it's like everyone knows it's a thing. And um, here I, you know, I'm a you know, relationship person and I don't take my own advice. So I, what I did is I, I separated them again. That was simple. I was just like, oh, okay, well, let's fix this. This is, you know, crystal clear. And then we went about it our own way. And I didn't try to change him. I just dealt with my own and, and figured out a way to have him be a part of my life, you know, in, with my way being my way and his way being his way. And so that's how we, that's how we solved that. But I bet you have really good advice on the money side of this for relationships. Well, and, the, and your, your way of dealing your money so, so differences is a sign of respect. You respect each other, not to change each other, but you did it. You created a, a system that allows you not to go crazy against each other. And that's, that's really important. And for me, it's always, I always recommend people have what I call money dates. And so they go out and they talk about what their parents' philosophy was about money, because it usually ends up with lots of laughter, but also a tremendous amount of insight into the financial values that have been created subconsciously many times, because we're not teaching money in school. So growing up, you- I'm learned, writing that down, by the way. <laughs> you learn the money habits from your parents. And so for instance, my parents are um, were very, very generous, but they were depression babies, just like my husband's parents. His parents, um, where he, his father was a longtime government employee and he still has every penny he ever earned. He's the tightest, tightest person I know. Very much um, he's kind of a, a penny pincher. My father, as, much, as hard as he worked and created assets, built assets, created his own wealth. But if he wanted something, he would figure out a way to earn the money to get it. And, um, and also very generous, get the shirt off, off his back. So even though they both grew up in similar times, eras, they, and they were both created wealth in their lives, they did, a, did it differently. And so his, what he experienced growing up was more of a, um, you know, not, not being generous, being very careful with every penny. And mine was, um, the more you give, the more you get. If you want something, you set a goal, you achieve it, and, and you share it. So we both had very different aspects and philosophies and coming together, understanding that allowed us to, to come together and figure out how we wanted to grow financially. Now we've been married 40 years. So 40 years ago, you know, we, we did, we basically um, started both of us with nothing and grouped everything we have together. So um, he kind of sits back and figures I can handle all the money side of things and knows that I'm going to take care of him. So, but every couple is different. Some people want to keep things separate and that's fine. Other people want to come together and, and co-mingle as long as you understand what you're doing and you have, you know, Mike, even though he's not involved in anything, we still meet with our bankers, our investment advisors together so that we are making those decisions together. And it's really important for people not to, for not one spouse not to feel completely disenfranchised and left out of it, particularly women. You know, I say a man is not a plan. And most women don't understand that your credit rating is different from your husband's. And so many times um, the man will die and the woman will be left with no credit and not understanding money. And so it's one of my missions is to get women to educate themselves about money. You're amazing. And see, that's all that's, uh, first of all, I'm absolutely going to do money dates now with my husband, <laughs> but if it were up to him, I mean, we've bought several houses together and literally every time it's just 
here, sign here, honey, sign here. <laughs> like he doesn't want to look at anything, you know, and I'm, so I'm just doing it all. But you don't also want to feel overwhelmed. You want to feel like they care. He's pretty good at, at acting like he cares, but with gratitude, you know, <laughs> but, but this is such good stuff. I love it. I, I could just, uh, you know, sit and drink tea with you all day long <laughs> and well, be like this with a note paper. <laughs> Tell me more. I teach everybody about the power of association. So for everybody watching and listening, you and I met at a, you know, a joint venture um, strategic Alliance summit. And it, I was invited there to talk about my new book, exit rich. And you were very excited and you want to help promote that. And, um, and as a result, we started talking and we, again, power of association, I invited you to be on the podcast. So I appreciate you coming and sharing your wisdom, Julianne. And for our watch, our listeners and viewers, how can they find you? Uh, they can find me on my website, which is spellingitout.com, just like it sounds, spelling it out. Thank you so much for having me. This is brilliant. I'm out. so grateful. I love, I love that. Spelling it out. Good, good idea. So please reach out to her, um, rewind and listen to this. Lots of gold nuggets. And if you have not um, joined the private Facebook group, Play Big Moment with Sharon Lecter, please do, because Julianne's going to hang in here and we're going to do another interview talking a little bit more personal about ups and downs as well as daily habits to success. So thank you, Julianne, and hang in there. And all of you, thank you for watching and listening and go out and have a fabulous day. Thanks for listening to this segment of the Play Big Movement podcast with Sharon Lecter. Thank you for listening to this segment of the Play Big Movement podcast. Please subscribe to iTunes and leave us a review, as well as join us in other areas of social media, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, at Sharon Lecter, and for Facebook, author Sharon Lecter. Thank you so much and have a fabulous day.